Welcome, everyone. I'm Xerxes Spencer, Senior Manager for Fellowship Programs here at the National Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's presentation. Has freedom of expression become a self-parody? Examples from Pakistan social media, featuring Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellow Nadeem F. Paracha. As many of you may know, the Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellows Program is an international exchange program funded by the US Congress to host some of the world's most dedicated democracy activists, scholars, and journalists who conduct independent research and outreach here at NED. We are now in our 17th year and have hosted since our inception in 2001 more than 270 fellows from over 90 countries from around the world. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for his unwavering commitment to journalistic independence, pluralism, and freedom of expression in Pakistan. Nadeem F. Paracha, or NFP as he is known to his readers, is a prominent Pakistani journalist and cultural critic currently associated with the Dawn, Pakistan's leading international English language daily. He is a widely read columnist who has commented on the rise of religious extremism and the importance of carrying forward Pakistan's democratic experiment. He's the author of three books, The End of the Past, The Pakistan Anti-Hero, and most recently, Points of Entry, which was just published this month, and I'm happy to share a copy with anyone who is interested. During his fellowship, he is publishing, writing his fourth book, which will trace the secular pluralistic roots of Pakistan's Muslim nationalism. In his presentation, Nadim will share the story of social media in Pakistan and how the rise of disinformation online has come to pose a threat to democratic values. In effect, as you will hear, it's a story about a story. Here is how it goes in a nutshell. In 2013, Nadim published a piece of satire in the Dawn newspaper alleging that the Nobel Prize winner Malala Yousafzai was a Western agent. Rather than accept the article for what it was, a parody, a comical misrepresentation of reality, a number of media outlets, including Iran's press TV network, reported on the satire as legitimate news. By the time the Dawn had issued disclaimers seeking to set the record straight, many thousands of social media users had shared the article as fact. In his remarks, Nadim will situate this story within the broader context of hoaxes, rumors, and other forms of disinformation that can go viral online. He will make the case that, as in other democratic spaces, Checks and balances are necessary on social media platforms to regulate undemocratic behavior online. We'll now hear from Nadim, who will speak for about 20 to 30 minutes. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NEDEvents or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at Any Democracy. If you have not already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved with today's event, most especially Daniel Samet. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Xerxes, for the kind words. And thank you, Nat, for hosting me today. And during my ongoing fellowship, it's been great working with you guys. And thank you all for coming on this hot and muggy afternoon. Oh, it was muggy. And this is the first time in four months it feels like home. <laughs> because where I come from, Karachi, it's like this nine months in a year. Back in 1983, <clears throat> when I entered my teens, got interested in pop music as well, 
There used to be a band, a UK band called the Fun Boy 3. And in 1983, they had a number one UK hit song, and the song was called The Lunatics Have Taken Over the Asylum. Now, I have always understood the social media to be as some sort of an asylum for those who thought that they were not being heard or seen. Owners of Twitter and Facebook insisted that their sites were an expression of for some new kind of direct democracy. They also claimed that social media would nurture the many sacred aspects of democracy, especially freedom of speech, freedom of expression, open debate. But ladies and gentlemen, if social media really is an asylum or was an asylum, it has been taken over by the lunatics. The internet is not largely a bad thing as such. I mean, indeed, many of us have forgotten how to write with a pen or read from a book. And porn has just become just too easy available. All this cannot be undone. And it shouldn't be undone as such. But it can be reformed. We have to move forward. Nevertheless, for example, for example, doesn't democracy give us the right to undo certain laws and amendments in the Constitution that have become a problem? Take, for example, the Second Amendment in the Pakistan Constitution. There's something about Second Amendments everywhere. <laughs> now, this amendment that I'm talking about was made in 1974 in the name of faith. It relegated a community of people to become an insignificant minority that was to be persecuted for calling themselves Muslim. It is a persecution which is now enshrined in our constitution. Or let's take the so-called blasphemy laws which were enacted in Pakistan in the 1980s. They too are now part of our constitution. I being a Muslim and a Democrat and a citizen of Pakistan who has voted in each and every election that has taken place in my country since 1988, I do not find any rational need to have such amendments, clauses and laws in my constitution. But unfortunately, in Pakistan, Many would be considered to be bad Muslims if they even asked that some of the reforms should be reformed, let alone being totally scrapped. It doesn't matter how these laws are being misused over and over again, sometimes by jealous husbands, sometimes by corrupt land grabbers, sometimes by cynical, illiterate mullahs, and they do so through blatant lies which can and have gotten innocent people killed and hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, unlike dictatorship and authoritarianism, democracy is a far more complex animal. This complexity often throws various contradictions. And I believe it is this aspect of democracy which is best demonstrated on the social media. On Twitter a few days ago, a social media personality in Pakistan tweeted that how, he, how much he hates democracy and how democracy is such a failure. He tweeted that democracy was a Western conspiracy which should be overthrown by a benevolent dictatorship. When he was confronted on Twitter, he instantly reminded those confronting him that it was his democratic right 
to say what he just said. He urged them to respect his freedom of speech. Such are the ironies facing democracy these days, especially on social media. A few years ago, a known Pakistani personality and a celebrity, a millennial, posted rants about how the West was encouraging the growth of homosexuality in Pakistan. The gentleman has similar views about democracy as well, or the kind of parliamentary democracy there is in Pakistan. So some Pakistanis were of the view that his rants were rather bigoted. His reply to them, it is my democratic right to air my views about this issue the way I want to. But interestingly, Facebook thought otherwise. Due to many complaints against his rant, Facebook suspended his account for promoting hate speech. This gentleman created a new account on Facebook and wrote an open letter to Mr. Mark Zuckerberg accusing him of not respecting his democratic right and the right of free speech. And voila, Mr. Zuckerberg personally reinstated this gentleman's account. Now how is one to describe such a scenario? Was this the aggravated gentleman's democratic right to instigate hatred against a community he did not like? Was it a democratic right? Or were those who got his account suspended being undemocratic? Or was Mr. Zuckerberg defending freedom of speech when he reinstated the aggravated gentleman's account? Ladies and gentlemen, it seems that social media tends to understand democracy as something which encourages a free-for-all attitude. That's why I believe many young people have begun to confuse democracy with anarchy. Freedom of speech is not about having the right to deliver hate speech. Back in 2005, when a Danish newspaper published a series of cartoons lampooning an Islamic figurehead, I wrote an article condemning this. I criticized this act. Now back home I'm considered to be a liberal Muslim who is associated with one of the most progressive English language dailies in Pakistan, Dawn. Now this is D-A-W-N, not D-O-N. Well, both when this article was, someone put this article up on a long forgotten social media site called Orkut. It used to be owned by Google, it's not there anymore. Well, someone posted up there, and both Don and myself faced a lot of backlash, especially from people and readers in Europe. The critics said, how can you, as in me, a liberal democrat, condemn this act? It is all about defending freedom of expression. So in another article, a few weeks later, I asked them, if that which creates offense and commotion in a large community of people is freedom of expression, then please explain and define the act of the rabid Taliban regime which blew up those magnificent Buddha statues in Afghanistan in 2001. How was that not freedom of expression? Democracy is a responsibility. It comes with checks and balances. That's why we have constitutions. But as I mentioned earlier, Certain amendments in certain constitutions have actually begun to enshrine and even encourage bigotry and violence. These amendments need to be undone. Just like the many Facebook accounts and Twitter handles, they need to be undone. There is nothing undemocratic about doing such a thing. 
democracy should stop behaving like an apologist. Because, for example, when we scan the social media landscape, those folks who detest democracy are the ones exploiting its many aspects the most, especially freedom of speech and expression. If this really is freedom of speech, then is it okay that some of this speech ends up instigating violence against a community and an individual? Before I go on, I think it is important to give you a brief background of the country I call home, Pakistan. Now imagine there was Google Images back in the 1960s and the 1970s. Had you typed Pakistan in the search bar, this would have come up. Or this. But if you type Pakistan now in Google Images, this comes up. So is this some sort of a conspiracy by Google against Pakistan? Because I live there, I have family there, I work there. The Pakistani middle class, the class I come from, and it is a rapidly expanding segment of the population, is not very different from the middle class in the United States or Europe. And what the heck is this? This is not a conspiracy by the elders of Zion running Google. This is the bitter fruit of the kind of constitutionalism and democracy that has evolved in Pakistan. Let me explain. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, president and then prime minister of Pakistan from December 1971 till July 1977 a populist demagogue, but one who came through an election. But he ended up sabotaging his own constitution, filling it with the most undemocratic amendments just to please a handful of nuts in the opposition and the society, and eventually his own ego. General Muhammad Ziaullah, who ruled Pakistan from July 1977 till August 1988, a reactionary military dictator. He got himself elected as president through a referendum, a bogus referendum, and then introduced even more controversial amendments in the Pakistan constitution though, so that Pakistan's democracy becomes more Islamic. Our post-dictatorship Democrats, the guys who were elected in the 1990s in the so-called decade of democracy in Pakistan. Benazir Bhutto, my hero, a hero of my generation of young men and women who stood up against the Ziaulak dictatorship, got flogged, tortured, arrested. And Mia Nawaz Sharif, twice elected prime minister in the 1990s. But unfortunately, they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't even want to touch the controversial amendments that had been made in the Constitution between 1974 and 1986. Their attitude was basically, let them be. Eat, leave, or rule, eat, leave, however you put it. More military men. General Parvez Musharraf, who ruled Pakistan from 1999 till about 2008. Now this one is interesting. This one posed as a modernist, out to rid the country of extremist groups, but eventually only getting rid of a few and nurturing others for some godforsaken convoluted strategic reason. This act of his not only ended up haunting his own regime, but the rest of Pakistan as well in the years to come. After him, 
even more Democrats. Asif Zardari, former president of Pakistan, husband of the late Benazir Bhutto, who was assassinated, unfortunately, in December 2007. And he now runs the Pakistan People's Party. Shabazz Sharif, he's the brother of Nawaz Sharif and most probably uh, aiming to become the next prime minister. And Imran Khan, a very popular opposition leader. But the problem is, democracy returned to Pakistan in 2008 with these guys. It is still there. We've had two elections. We are about to have another one late July this year. But many supporters and many members of all these parties don't mind rubbing shoulders with the extremist outfit, outfits just to bag a few extra votes. And worse, worse, many pol members of political parties have been seen and heard accusing each other of violating the blasphemy laws in Pakistan, which is something extremely dangerous to do. And how are they doing it? Mostly through Twitter handles and Facebook pages, the cutting edge of modern democracy. Recently, the outgoing government in Pakistan, which was elected in 2013, supposedly, now supposedly and allegedly tried to slightly reform a tiny aspect of a controversial law, which is based on our faith. And do you know who was one of the first people to react? Not these guys, but him. A graduate of Oxford University, a former cricket, Pakistan cricket star, socialite, darling of gossip and fashion magazines turned politician. He's not a mullah. He heads a popular center-right party which firmly believes in democracy. At least that's what he claims. Why did he do it then? Why did he raise the red flag? accusing the government of trying to alter a sacred amendment just to score a few points against the government on Twitter. He turned the whole thing to be about some diabolic conspiracy against the Pakistan constitution's Islamic character. But it will be unfair to just talk about him. He wasn't the only one. His lead was immediately taken by other pa opposition party members, and they started doing the same. And they were all using Twitter and Facebook, which then eventually managed to get the attention of these guys. Now, the religious parties in Pakistan have hardly ever gotten more than 4% of the vote. But what, do, but what they have is what most right-wing radical parties in South Asia have, in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, the ability to form or churn out mobs, violent, dumb, crazy mobs. They are very good at making these. So when these guys got involved, the government was rattled. Immediately, the government responded by saying, oh, sorry, it was a clerical mistake in the document that we presented in the National Assembly. It was a typo. That is the word the government used, that it was a typo. Then to further its point that it was a typo, fans of this gentleman were unleashed on Twitter by the government this time. Now, he is the son-in-law of the chief of the recently outgoing ruling party. Now, this guy is facing numerous corruption charges and cases in the courts. 
but he openly glorifies those who are willing to slay anyone who even thinks about reforming the controversial laws in the Constitution. And then it happened. A government minister was shot by a member of an extremist group who accused him of introducing that diabolical document with the typo. It is said, it is said, that the would-be assassin had been incensed by the whole matter after reading Twitter and Facebook posts condemning the government of trying to reform the sacred laws. Thankfully, the minister survived the attempt. But when the minister, who is also on Twitter, appeared on Twitter to tweet his relief, now listen to this very carefully. The poor chap was now trolled by those who reminded him that it was his mother who back in the 1980s had pushed for the laws for which he was shot at because some believed he was behind the document with the typo. And the truth is, his mom was one of the architects of the law back in 1986 when she was part of the bogus parliament under Ziaulag. Well, <clears throat> as they say, what goes around comes around. A lesson Pakistani Democrats and dictators posing to become, uh, as Democrats refuse to learn. Turning things like constitutionalism and freedom of speech into a mockery. A mockery which is now all too vivid on social media, for example. Social media truly has turned freedom of speech into a self-parody. Ladies and gentlemen, some five to six years before the whole fake news phenomenon on social media became such a hotly debated issue, a 15-year-old schoolgirl, Malala Yousafzai, was shot in the face and head by extremists in Pakistan's scenic Swat Valley. Now, just how such a beautiful region as Swat could produce such monstrous hate. But unfortunately it did. Thanks mainly to all the folks that I briefly introduced to you earlier, right from the 1970s onwards. A badly injured Malala was flown by the Pakistan army and government to the UK. There, while she was fighting for her life in the hospital, Many in Pakistan and many Pakistanis living in the US and Europe were going ballistic on Twitter and Facebook. No, not all of them were condemning the cowardly act of shooting a teenage schoolgirl because she refused to give in to the demands of the extremists who didn't want girls to go to school in SWAT. Instead, many in the social media were condemning Malala for bringing Pakistan a bad name. Months later, things got even more bizarre. On social media, she became a Western agent who, in concert with Pakistan's enemies, had staged the assassination attempt so that the Pakistan army can use this as an excuse to attack and dismantle the wonderful Islamic regime that the cuddly Taliban Teletubbies had set up in beautiful Swat. And this was just one theory doing the rounds on social media. So more out of disgust than anything else, I penned a long piece for Dawn, satirizing all those brilliant men and women who, who were fully utilizing the right of free speech by spreading on Twitter and Facebook all these wonderful theories. The piece was called Malala, the real story with evidence. It was written like an entirely straight-faced news report in which a Don's reporter got some exclusive scoop on Malala. And uh, as I said, it was written in a very serious tone and very reporter-like. 
But let me share with you, it's a long piece, but let me share with you just, just a few things which this report revealed. Malala was born to Hungarian parents in Budapest and named Jane. The parents were recruited by the CIA and given a crash course in Christianity, hypnosis and karate. They landed in Pakistan and headed for Swat posing as NGO workers. They got in touch with a low-level ISI agent who helped them find a Muslim family to adopt Jane. The family that adopted her was, of course, converted to Christianity. They changed her name to Malala and instilled in her the fear of Jesus. <laughs> Malala started to write a blog that asked the militants of Swa to put down the weapons, pick up a Bible and boogie. The militants requested Malala to stop writing her blogs and finish her homework instead. CIA recruited a Pashto-speaking Italian-American loner called Robert De Niro, <laughs> who was living in New York. The Italian-American arrived in Swat posing as an Uzbek homeopath. It was him who staged the fake shooting. As I said, it's a long piece, and it also informs that the Taliban have a special archaeology wing, and even a department of quantum physics. And there are photographs in the piece as well, some of which I'll share. <laughs> An undercover ISI agent appearing in a homemade Spider-Man costume. Malala bungee jumping when we were being told that she was being shot. A lie. And of course, the CIA assassin. An hour after this piece went up on Don's website, I received a call from the editor of the website, the late Musaddiq Samwal, a dear friend of mine who passed away a few days ago, or a few years ago. He said that he had received a call <clears throat> from Don's publishers, and they wanted the piece to be taken down. Now, anyone who writes for Don or works there hardly ever sees the publishers. We know their name, but we don't really see because the editor is all powerful in Dawn, one of the few newspapers in Pakistan where the editor is actually more powerful than the publisher, or at, or at least it seems that way. So when the publishers called Musaddiq, the editor of uh, Dawn's website, this meant there was something serious. They never called. Why did they want the piece to be taken down? Well, Musaddiq told me that the publishers had received calls from certain sensitive agencies and institutions asking him to reveal the names of the sources mentioned in the piece. <laughs> I'm sure they wanted to know about the rogue ISI agent in the Spider-Man suit. But by then, by then, the article had already been translated into Urdu and put up as breaking news on the websites of various right-wing Urdu newspapers. Eventually, it was then picked up by one of the official media outlets of Iran, Press TV, and presented as fact. It was also translated into Persian. I've always wondered, why would Iran have a problem with Malala? Nevertheless, as the piece, as this piece of satire was going ballistic on Twitter and Facebook, Musaddiq cut a deal with the publishers. He told them that he will put a disclaimer at the bottom of the piece, saying that this is a piece of fiction and satire and not fact. But it didn't work. So he put another disclaimer right at the top. It's still there. So the piece was now sandwiched between these two disclaimers. It still didn't work. Thousands of people kept sharing the piece as fact on social media. 
And these included lawyers, doctors, engineers, university and college students. So much so that the very next day, this news of how a piece of satire had been taken as fact by so many people was published in the Washington Post. I don't know what, if I should feel proud about this or like, <laughs> I don't know. Six years later, when Malala returned to Pakistan for a visit, she was mostly warmly welcomed by the government and the military, and especially by millions of young Pakistani students in girls' schools, especially in Swat and other big and small towns of Pakistan. Yet, Six years after this piece was published, this article returned with Malala to Pakistan, this time mostly on WhatsApp. A presenter of a terrible TV talk show conveniently translated certain portions of this piece into Urdu and got it published in a newspaper as fact. And then some bored aunts and uncles with their aluminum hats on began to circulate it on WhatsApp and then on Twitter and then on Facebook as fact. Now, I am on Twitter and Facebook as well, and I have a pretty decent following on both. But I hardly ever engage, especially with strangers. But a tweet from one desperate chap landed on my Twitter timeline. He was sharing the newly translated version of the satire six years later when Malala had come back. His tweet went something like this, truth about Malala finally sees the light. And of course, the portions that were be translated, he had them in JPEG. I couldn't help but engage with this idiot. I told him that the piece was written by me six years ago and it is clearly a satire, a send-up, a parody. His reply, and I'm not exaggerating this, it is my democratic right <laughs> to believe what I want to believe in. Stop being such a liberal fascist. <laughs> and before I finally blocked him on Twitter, he went on and on about how I had no respect for freedom of speech and how I was a fake liberal and a fake democrat. Nevertheless, after I blocked him, within hours he managed to message me in my Facebook messenger. And very innocently asked me why I had blocked him on Twitter. And my reply to him, it was my democratic right to do what I did. <laughs> to cut a long sorry story short, with the kinds of debates and news items we find on social media sites these days, and the kind of social media savvy presidents, prime ministers, politicians, and the supporters there are now out there, I would suggest that democracy too should now come with a disclaimer. It should be, this is satire, not democracy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Nadeem, for that very wise and witty account of social media and um, the dangers that it poses to democracy, not only in Pakistan, but elsewhere in the world. Um, before we turn it over to the floor for questions, I wonder if I might take the prerogative as moderator to pose a question to you, which um, I know you have some thoughts on, which is to share with us some of your own perspectives on how to regulate um, undemocratic behavior online? What are the sorts of checks and balances you might envision and who would take ownership to implement them? Would it be the owners, the managers of the social media sites? Would it be um, official authorities or some combination thereof? Well, I've asked more questions than given any answers, but yes, um, <clears throat> it is, like I said, a very complex issue. 
Um, you, one really doesn't know how to sort of uh, uh, go about regulating what's being said in the name of freedom of speech um, without being accused of becoming authoritarian or clamping down on free media, free speech. This is a very complex. But what I've noticed is that instead of coming up with a response, now responses usually constitute something more streamlined, intelligent. But instead of coming with a response, a lot of people who are bothered by what's going on social media are reacting. Now when you react, you end up falling in the same trap as the people who are you reacting against. So there have been a lot of reactions um, because the fear is that, for example, if democratic governments start doing this, regulating the social media, uh, then there's the question is, then, then what's the difference between, let's say, if the United States does it, then the United States and, and Russia, or what's happening in China. So, but I think there is a way. In Pakistan, for example, when conventional media went a bit crazy, a few years ago, uh, the government, a uh, uh, democratic government, did not uh, impose any restrictions, but it asked its owners and uh, a few senior journalists to sit together and come up with certain uh, code of ethics and how to sort of not sound the way they were sounding because it was becoming dangerous. It was tried, but, it, but it somehow it didn't work. And now what has happened is that certain institutions with authoritarian in nature have started doing what the owners were supposed to do or should have done or what the democratic should, government should have done. But there's, like I said, there's so much fear in Democrats that if they do that, how will they not be accused of doing or behaving like dictators. So I really don't have any uh, like guideline exactly how to go about it, but it's something that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let us turn the floor over to you in the audience, and um, I invite you to raise your hands and ask questions and identify yourself. Um, yes, Risham, if you could just introduce yourself. Hello everyone, my name is Risham and I'm from also from Pakistan and I'm a Hereford Youth Fellow with the NAD. The, your presentation was amazing, thank you so much for thank that. You. What I wanted to know is that like you mentioned, the internet space has become anarchy, it's crazy and it's kind of hard to have a proper sensible dialogue with anyone. I'm going to call someone in a conservative idiot, they're going to call me radical feminist. It's preaching to the choir. So as a content generator, what advice would you have for other content generators to actually try to create a more inclusive dialogue where you can actually get someone to understand your point of view? What are some of the techniques and approaches in the context of Pakistan we can have as content generators to not just make it about, you know, just, have, just going crazy over, you're wrong or I'm right, actually including them? Thank you. Um, like I said, <clears throat> we need to respond and engage with uh, people we don't like and vice versa. But like I said, what's happening is that we are reacting. Unfortunately, I've noticed that sometimes the pressure from the right groups or the right trolls, the rightist trolls, is so much that the liberals, or so-called liberals and democrats, adopt, start adopting the same attitude and they start reacting and they start calling the others names so in the end nothing is solved it becomes sort of a strange uh, stalemate and it just things keep getting worse so I'm, I think we need to re to engage with them and try to figure them out why they are saying what they are saying and expect the same from them and I've, I've, I've experimented with that and it has worked on occasions. So um, that's what I would do instead of calling them fascists just because they're calling you uh, whatever. Uh, that won't cut it. 
Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Just wait for the mic if you would. Thank you. Okay. My name's Aisha. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I'm very curious to know about your experience writing for Hilal, uh, the uh, official uh, army magazine, how you got into it, how was it uh, writing for them? Like I said, engage. <laughs> Back in the 1980s, uh, um, I was uh, picked up by the military, twice tortured, slapped, kicked, called, whatever. So I had a pretty bad uh, relationship with them. But after the 2014 attack in Peshawar, where the militants, the extremists killed 140 kids, and the way the military finally reacted, um, we should remember that it was the military who actually pushed the democratic government to finally react the way it was supposed to. Otherwise, we know all our Democrats were just sitting there navel-gazing and talking about, let's do dialogue, peace, while thousands of Pakistanis had already died. So that is when I thought that there might have been some sort of a shift in thinking in the military. And uh, they were the ones who sort of wanted to open a dialogue, not only with me, but other so-called liberals as well. Some responded and were willing to engage with them, so something better can come out. Some just, like I said, just reacted. And uh, to me, the reaction bit is not going to work anymore. So that's how I got to start writing for Hilal occasionally. <laughs> Hopefully. Yes, the gentleman in the front. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, Ali Rizvi, I'm actually a journalist, um, also filmmaker. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the next five years, uh, what your hopes and dreams are in terms of where you want to see the conversation in Pakistan, what kind of conversation, maybe 10 years from now, uh, what do you want to see? I'm an optimist. Uh, <clears throat> Things might not be looking so well, but compare Pakistan from what, where we were five years ago, between 2004 and 2013. Over 30 to 40,000 Pakistanis had been killed in suicide attacks. Between 2014 and um, 2016 or 2017, there has been a 70% decrease in these attacks. So there is hope. There is hope. We've, we've created such a massive mess in that country in the last 30, 35 years. It'll take time. It will take time. But the thing is, I've noticed that everybody has become so, um, they just, just want everything to be done right away. It cannot be done that way. The narrative which was created in the 1980s still holds very strong in the minds of young people who were sort of uh, indoctrinated with it. So that needs to be uh, countered in an intelligent, responsive manner and not a reactive manner. And uh, like I said, I'm an optimist and I think if we could, because once it seemed that it was over for Pakistan when so many people were dying and there was a suicide attack almost every day. It seemed that nothing can be done about this country and this country will break, but it didn't. The problem was tackled head on. So if that problem on a physical level can be achieved, then we can do the same in other areas of itself. For example, the social mindset. That's, that's the biggest challenge, how to sort of challenge this narrative with a counter-narrative and what should that counter-narrative should be. Should it be secular? Should it be Muslim modernist? There are so many questions out there. But the dialogue is going on. There may be a lot of anger in it, there may be a lot of uh, accusations and counter-accusations, but the dialogue has already started. It's right in front of us, happening right now. And hopefully, um, something good will come out of it. I am sure something will come out with, from it. Yeah, Mark? 
Mark Platner from NET. Yes, uh, thank you. That was really a brilliant uh, presentation, Nadine. Um, in your own explanation, there was this paradox that you called attention to, that these extremist groups attract three or four percent of the vote, and yet people, candidates from the major parties, leaders of the major parties, feel they need to appeal to them. And I guess I want to ask if you can explore why that is uh, a little bit more. Is it, is it intimidation? Is it the violence that does it? Or is it, I mean, it doesn't seem like seeking of votes would be enough to explain it, so. It is intimidation. First of all, uh, a lot of center-right parties in Pakistan who doesn't have, don't have beards and don't go around talking like this, what they plan, they try to do is there are very uh, reactionary conservative constituencies in Pakistan with a lot of votes. Uh, so what the center-right parties try to do and sometimes even left liberal parties try to do is to appeal to these guys, these smaller parties who are openly religious, uh, to get those votes in those constituencies to begin with. Because the voters are to begin with, the voters are pragmatic. They know that these religious parties will not be able to give them jobs or make roads or get them water or electricity. It has to be the mainstream parties. But I think it's the intimidation thing as well, which, uh, uh, for example, like I said, what gives these parties, which hardly get 4% of the votes, the power to do what they do is the Constitution. Now, that's the irony. They know if they stand up and accuse someone of blasphemy or being un-Islamic, that they can go to the court, right up to the Supreme Court, take out the Constitution and say that I have got, got this right in the Constitution to do this. So it is that fear that how these parties, these groups, exploit this very illiberal constitution, um, that a lot of mainstream parties, which may not be so radical and not, are not, um, they try to keep them happy, that they shouldn't sort of attack them, and uh, take them to the court, or uh, come out on the street with their mobs against them, and uh, nobody wants to sort of bother them. And this was not the case before the 1970s. This started happening not uh, uh, after 1974 onwards and then 1980s when our document, the Constitution, st started having these um, laws. So these laws actually strengthened these groups um, socially, if not politically as such. I hope that makes sense. Yes, the gentleman in the middle, if you could raise your hand. Sorry. It's not your fault. So, regarding... But if you could kindly introduce yourself, oh, please. I'm Eric Simpson. So, regarding the conspiracy theories that are specifically anti-American, do you think it would be helpful for the U.S. to counter that with its own narrative that portrayed itself in a better light or to combat the misinformation that's prevalent in Pakistan? Or is that a quixotic endeavor because the American name is so tarnished and people realize that it has a vested interest in promoting itself? Well, American uh, narratives or American name comes with a huge baggage. Uh, we've been allies since 1959, but the Americans have always engaged more with, the, with dictators and uh, sometimes during the Cold War with the chaps I'm talking about who hardly get 4% of the vote, they used to get a lot of American funding as well, supposedly to keep the communists and the socialists out. 
So, um, but after the uh, end of the Cold War, these guys also turned against the Americans. Um, yes, uh, but, but let me just tell you, and I was saying this the other day, interestingly, and I don't know why, I'm trying to investigate, interestingly, in the last one, one and a half or two years, the anti-American sentiment in, in Pakistan has really gone down. And I'm surprised nobody's commenting on that. It really has. Um, I don't know, you hardly hear people like sort of bad mouth in America anymore on television or on social media. They're not, they're more now occupied by China and uh, Saudi Arabia, what's happening in Saudi Arabia and Iran and Syria and Yemen, America's there, right? It doesn't mean that there's now great love for America, but it has gone down and I'm trying to investigate why that is. So I think if America wants to counter, come up with a narrative, now's the time. Now's the time. And I don't see it happening with Mr. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> Yes, any other questions? Alec, um, Dimitrina, and then the person behind you. Let's start with Dimitrina. If I could have a show of hands to see who else. Uh, Alex, Dimitrina okay. Petrova, uh, uh, Reagan Fassel Fellow, too. Um, from <laughs> Bulgaria. Na na from, uh, Najim, uh, how did you know that all these people who uh, re-send, retweeted, and so on. Uh, do you said many times did this as fact, as fact, as fact. If I had received that, I might have sent it around not as fact. I understood the parody. I wanted to spread the parody. So that's my question. How did you? No, you, you see, <clears throat> that's what happened. Um, the sort of people who are sharing it, majority of them. They're the sort of people who were, if you see their timeline on Twitter or Facebook, uh, they hated Malala, they hated America, West, you know, so you understand. So they would never even, uh, because the parody or well, the satire was against them basically, they never got that. They thought that this reporter had finally found something which was very close to their heart and they've always been saying it. So they start, they got excited and they started, look at what the Iranians did, they thought, ah, finally, something to get to the West, uh, a, a, a news report about this young schoolgirl being a Western agent in Pakistan. Even they, I mean like, of course Iran was not sharing it because uh, they had a great sense of humor. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why the Washington Post ran a story as well. Yeah, the gent the woman in the middle, and then Alex. Um, my name is Shahira. I'm a student at the George Washington University. Um, Nadim Sahab, uh, do you see it as a legitimate critique of the liberal and the democratic individuals and collectives who are trying to have a discourse on social media, but the tonality, the design, the demeanor of their of their being on this on, on the social media, their language, their choice of words. All of that exude a certain kind of elitism which is perhaps out of touch with the middle and the lower middle class. Well said, but I won't call it elitism. Like I said, it's, they've, they've, they started to react. Instead of responding in an intelligent manner, in a tongue-in-cheek manner, in a humorous manner, they have started to react, you know. So that's why they start being called elitist or arrogant. Uh, but like I uh, said in the beginning to Xerxes saying uh, question we need to respond and not react because we end up falling in the same trap which those guys are trapped in so yeah Alex Mikesa from Zimbabwe thank you um, fascinating uh, presentation Nadim um, I'm also a, a NED fellow here, along with uh, Nadim. Um, I, I also use social media quite a lot. I, I use uh, Twitter. Um, and my experience at the beginning, which was about three years ago, because I used to use Facebook, I use Twitter more now, was uh, 
I, I try to be the nice guy who answers every question, who responds and engages, <laughs> and engages even the most uh, vitriolic uh, characters on, on Twitter. Uh, it, it worked for some time. My friends used to call me St. Alex. Um, but of course, we are in an election season now in Zimbabwe and things have gotten very hot. And um, I, I've, I've changed tact and I simply thank, thank God for the, or thank Twitter for the block button or the mute one. Um, it's just non-engagement because it becomes really, uh, because the, the, the uh, technique I think is to, if I'm going to raise an important issue that I would like to, to be discussed, they'll simply come up with a new subject in order to divert you. And then they dilute the whole conversation. And if you block them, they will come screaming that you are not democratic, uh, that you are not, um, you are not as liberal as you say you are. But, you know, these are people who are simply there to, to distract. So I've noticed also the way that you handle situations. Uh, but for very purely um, selfish reasons, I'm going to ask you a question about General Musharraf, because you, you talked about it. He came in in 1999 through a military coup, and you can understand why I'm saying for purely selfish reasons. I want to understand, uh, perhaps from your experience in Pakistan, as a Zimbabwean, we are only a few months into a similar situation, but I'd like to know what the projection is. What happened? And you, you said he was able to look after some, but he was able to... Uh, to go after others. What happened during that era? If you could just elaborate a little bit on, on that. Well, like uh, any dictator, especially in Pakistan, um, he remained um, a military chief or a military um, um, head and a military ruler for about two years. Then as it happens, uh, they start believing that they were very popular, so they uh, create a political party which uh, instantly um, elects them as their president and then they go into an election uh, which are largely uh, rigged and uh, that is when the downfall starts because uh, in Pakistan uh, we've had about three, four military dictatorships but we've also had times of democracy and I personally believe the people uh, they love to vote. They, they, they know their democratic rights. And, uh, and they can see they're being made, made a fool of. Like, for example, when Musharraf created his political party and went in an election with his party in 2002, 2002 the turnout was, not, was between 20 to 25 percent only. So that shows that people knew that this is an army chief, uh, army strongman, but we will not take him seriously as a Democrat, but let's see what he does as an army guy. So what he started doing, he did try to reform a few things. The economy did get sort of a bit better, but he played this game. Um, he went after one set of militants, but didn't touch the other set, because supposedly due to some strategic reason that the armed forces in Pakistan had at that time that these guys which we are nurturing might help us in the future maybe in Afghanistan or Kashmir um, it's a ridiculous thinking but that's how they, they thought and what happened eventually was that instead of going to Afghanistan or Kashmir they turned inwards eventually and uh, Musharraf faced a lot of violence from them as well so then, um, in two, 2005, 2006, the economy started to collapse because it was make, made mainly a bubble. And people came out on the streets and wanted to go. He was ousted. And he thought he was being very clever. And he was ousted and uh, forced to resign in 2008. So there is hope in Zimbabwe. <laughs> Chris Walker at the back has a question. And who else? Brian and the woman behind Brian Joseph. Okay. So Nadim, you've uh, made a very eloquent uh, presentation on the challenges that you faced in the Pakistan
context. Just wonder if you would say a word beyond Pakistan as to whether it's um, the nature of the debate in Pakistan using social media that requires a response rather than, rather than a reaction, or whether it's the um, design of the social media platforms themselves, which then has enormous implications for everyone. And of course, we're seeing some of this in other places too. So maybe you could just reflect on that for a moment. Oh, uh, definitely. It's that, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, it it cut, cr cuts across uh, nations and people. And we're seeing this happening not only in Pakistan, uh, but I would say, <coughs> for example, the, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of the largest democracies in the world, India, our neighbor, it's happening there in a much more radical and f uh, fearful manner. Um, it's happening in the United States, in Europe, um, sometimes the sort of posts and debates I see on social media in, in, in developed democracies, it's stunning. So it's, it's a universal problem. And you are right, I think it is the nature of how social media has evolved. And not much was done because I remember uh, uh, more than five, six years ago, uh, some uh, French journalists did write about this and uh, criticized uh, this whole platform and that it will and, and she uh, predicted that it's going to create problems and I remember she was criticized for being elitist and uh, old-fashioned and undemocratic but it's amazing what she wrote I think it was in The Guardian has come out to be exactly the way she feared it would and like it's it's everywhere. Um, it's it's stunning. It's stunning that India has never had a military dictatorship. It's it's, it's always been a democracy. It's a large, massive democracy. But the sort of debate, and let's just stick to the social media aspect of it, which I sometimes follow, is stunning and scary. Scary. And, and it's surprising that they have Pakistan's history as an example to learn from, and they're not learning anything from that. And uh, they are trying to achieve what Pakistan achieved in 30, 35 years. They want to achieve it right here during this one turn of Mr. Modi. Uh, the sort of violence, the sort of rhetoric, the, the exploitation of faith, religion, and mob, mob rule. It's amazing, and uh, it's universal, and I have no clue how to regulate this without being uh, uh, becoming a Putin or a, <laughs> or a Chinese <laughs> dictator. But I'm sure there's a way. I'm sure there's a way. Brian Joseph. Thanks, Nadeem. It's fascinating. I have a sort of a very easy question for you. Would you write the article again? <laughs> With or without the disclaimer? <laughs> um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't because it, it made me feel bad because she was just a 15-year-old schoolgirl and she was doing whatever she could in a place which was under the Teletubbies rule uh, in those days and uh, it was very brave of her and uh, I don't know what she had to go through when this article came out I'm sure she was would have been shocked as well and um, uh, it got a lot of publicity and so much so that six years later I'm still talking about it uh, but uh, no, I want to write that again. Not really. Um, maybe something even more blatant and slapstick, but not, not the sort of satire. Nadeem, I wonder if you could say a word about the extent to which the reaction to your article was more a reflection of people's lack of awareness and understanding of what satire is to what extent was it people like the Iran Press TV Network and other media entities that recognized it for what it was but still usurped it for, its, for their own ulterior motives 
and what was it, to what extent was it anti-Malala, um, um, anti-Western sentiment that was driving this uh, willingness to embrace it as legitimate news as opposed to a parody? I think it's, it's, <clears throat> it's just that <clears throat> certain emotions of hatred and bigotry sort of blinds you. So I was, I was shocked. I was shocked that a lot of people, so many people actually didn't get, I uh, shared with you the sort of content there, 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 there was in, in that piece, the sort of photographs there were, still a lot of people didn't get it. That, that, that was shocking. And then I realized maybe, uh, I remember when uh, this happened and there was such a uh, heated debate between pro-Malala faction and anti-Malala faction, people were just going around trying to look for something to throw at the other person's face. So I'm, think, I'm sure a lot of people just read a few opening paragraphs and they thought, oh, this, this is what I can use. And it sort of steamrolled from there. Um, but like I said, despite the fact that uh, we put so many disclaimers, <laughs> it still didn't work. Um, maybe the people who even realized that it was satire by Hayden Malala knew that most of the people won't get it, so may as well use it. So um, yeah, it was, it, it, was, it was a shock. It was a shock. And uh, whenever I write uh, uh, satire now, which is rare, I'm very careful. <laughs> very careful. Yeah. Um, Margarita. Well, Brian had his hand up first, so I'll get to Margarita in a moment. Brian, you asked your question. Sorry, the woman behind Brian. Hi, my name is Bridget McNamara. I work at the Osgood Center for International Studies. Um, I was just uh, wondering, despite all the um, hypocrisy and self-parody that comes with social media, you say you're an optimist, so like, do you still think, um, despite all this and despite all the backlash that comes from it, it's still a positive, it has a positive impact, especially in Pakistan, because you mentioned there's been a de-escalation in violence. Do you think those two things could be correlated? Just like the um, increase I in so. social media out outlets. I think so, for example, uh, with the decrease in violence, um, the, 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 the narrative, the Twitter and the Facebook posts of the apologists, for example, who uh, were trying to justify uh, the violence of the militants by saying that, oh, well, they didn't get justice and et cetera, all that nonsense. That sort of got sidelined a bit. Uh, so there is a relationship, definitely. And when they saw the military finally uh, standing up saying enough is enough, we're going after them. And then the government followed the military. So. Uh, those guys which we used to see uh, tweeting uh, all the nice things about the extremists and sitting on television and justifying um, navel gazing about you know why how these guys were mistreated that's why they're angry uh, that sort of got sidelined a bit but uh, it keeps coming back but those people have definitely um, um, decreased and their presence on social media has decreased as well. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm still hopeful. Um, maybe won't, we won't need to regulate it. <laughs> maybe we'll re it's, it'll, it'll regulate itself. But we need to do a lot of things outside the social media for these, uh, these sort of things not to erupt on the social media. And like I said, the decrease in violence in Pakistan, definitely, comparatively speaking only, did make the social media debates slightly better. So it's all depend what happens outside social media as well for it to regulate itself. Margarita? Harvard Youth Fellow from Chile. Thank you. Um, so I, you kind of already mentioned this, but I was wondering if you think that we should refrain from writing parody and satire today, like in this age so full of trolls and lack of digital literacy. I mean, I know there's a beauty to it, but maybe now, like in this particular context, how the world is today, uh, it does more harm than good maybe. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, maybe, uh, but we have to be very careful on, for example, who we are uh, picking up as characters. Um, like, it, I will, I, I, when I say that I would not write a satire again, but I meant I will not write a satire 
which includes or involves uh, Malala Yousafzai, for example, young girl. Um, I don't mind satirizing a lot of other people who are all powerful. Yeah? Um, but there is a perverse uh, feeling about a lot of people not getting it as well. So that's a rush, but, uh, but I would be careful, uh, especially these days. Uh, you might say that it's satire and a lot of people will take it seriously and go after you. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing the sort of world that's opened up on social media. I, I'm, I didn't know these guys existed, you know. For a while they were just these aluminum hat guys just sitting in a basement. Now they become mainstream. So you have to be careful. Um, Nadeem, I wonder if I might ask you a closing question, which is, at the outset you had the then and now, and you had said that if Google Images existed back then, you would see a more peaceful time. If Facebook and Twitter existed then, would you think the discourse then would have been more civil? Or is, in fact, the bigotry, um, the disinformation, something that cuts across time as well as space, and it's just that these new social media platforms give you the forum to air them in a way that um, earlier fora did not allow you to. No, I think, of course, uh, it wasn't all um, utopia. Not, everything wasn't all that great even then. Uh, but definitely, comparatively speaking, things were far better. And had uh, Twitter and Facebook been the there, people would still be talking about religion and non-religion, but nobody would have, I'm sure that nobody would have been accusing each other of blasphemy or, uh, or, or uh, insulting uh, religion, these sort of things, because that ideas were there, but they were on, on, on the fringe. But what happened in, from the mid-1970s onwards, especially when Saudi Arabia became very powerful after the Arab-Israel war in 1973, um, this whole new thing came up and uh, Muslims became very conscious about who they were and what they should believe uh, and uh, they were somehow convinced that what they were before the mid-1970s they were that was something to do with their colonial legacies and and something uh, they, they were slaves um, not realizing that from being supposed Western slaves they became Saudi slaves um, but uh, discourse, because I was, uh, was definitely far more intelligent in those days, uh, I can see that, and uh, people would have been discussing more about beer, I think, uh, than beard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me close by thanking you for a fascinating overview of the a rather disturbing trend in Pakistan. Pakistan definitely needs more responsible journalists such as yourself, content generators like Risham and others in the room. And we very much hope that you are the leaders of tomorrow and not those with the long flowing beards. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.